Hello my friends. Welcome to another Friday Reads on my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. If you're new here, I'm Lindy and I read a lot. Before I get into the books that I have finished in the last week, I have some biblio adventures to tell you about. On Wednesday night was the annual Croiso lecture that the uh, I'm pausing here because they've just changed their name it used to be the Canadian Literature Center here in Edmonton and now they're at the Center for Literatures in Canada and I love that name change it is subtle but Canadian literature is not a monolith and by changing it to Center for Literatures in Canada, it's more, there's more of the idea that literatures are a multitude and what they have in common is the place where they are written, which is in Canada. Yeah, so the Center for Literatures in Canada. Anyway, this year, the Canadian author who gave the lecture is Wade Compton. I talked about his collection of short stories, The Outer Harbor, recently. I will link to that below. His talk is called Towards Anti-Racist Politics, and it is going to be published in a book form. So uh, I actually look forward to reading it because he said so many interesting things. Um, ideas were just sparking off in my head as he was talking and I want to spend more time with them. So I'm looking forward to the printed version of it as well. Glass Bookshop, which is a local independent bookshop here in Edmonton, had a table with some of his other books and one that I hadn't seen before by him, this graphic novel, The Blue Road. The illustrator for this is April de la Noche Milne. I haven't read it yet, looking forward to it, um, but what I know from what I've glanced through is that the central character is a girl named Lacuna who doesn't have a family, and that just got me right away. A girl named Lacuna. Oh, and it's a migrant story, so. Yes, you'll be hearing more about this. I decided to link to the class bookshop in my notes down below in case any of you uh, hear about books that I talk about and don't know how to get a hold of them. Glass Bookshop uh, ships across Canada. Now, if you're outside of Canada, it's worth contacting them to see if you can make arrangements to have uh, books that you're interested in shipped to other places because perhaps it's possible as it's a shame that so many great Canadian books don't get picked up by publishers outside of Canada and then they don't get the readers right anyway uh, the other exciting things that have happened. There's a couple of long lists that have dropped recently. The Women's Prize for Fiction, that was on March 7th, uh, and many other booktubers have already made comments, so I'm not going to say anything about that yet, except I'm going to be reading uh, some of those books on that list. And on, on Wednesday, the Carol Shields Prize for Fiction uh, dropped its inaugural long list. So this is for women and non-binary writers in Canada and the US. So I am going to link to their long list below in case you haven't seen it. Like the Women's Prize list, this one has got books that I know about, some that I've read, some by authors that I know of but didn't know they had a new book, and some by authors that I hadn't heard of at all. So a great discovery tool. It looks like there's some wonderful stuff on there. I will be talking more about the Carol Shields Prize 
But that's all I'm going to say for now because I have six books to tell you about that I have finished recently, starting with a ghost story novella. Now, I heard about this from Karen of Roving Reader. She has done a standalone review. I will link it below. And after she read it, she asked me if I had because she wanted to talk to somebody about it. So I read it. We had a, a bit of discussion over Voxer. So I guess you could call this a pseudo buddy read or that's what Sean the Book Maniac calls it anyway. The book is Bodies of Water by V. H. Leslie. It is uh, set in London with two timelines, one in Victorian England and the other in contemporary times. And in both cases, it's the same building. So in Victoria times, it was a hydrotherapy institution where women would go to get treated with all kinds of water, water things. And in contemporary times, it's being made into apartments. It's got uh, bisexual queer content in the older timeline. It's got all of these mythological references to water spirits and uh, a lot about feminism and the role of women in society and it's extremely atmospheric and those are things that I really enjoyed about this novella. If that sounds interesting to you and you are participating in March Mystery Madness, this one counts. I did double check with Marilyn Maya Mendoza, who is one of the hosts for March Mystery Madness. Look for the link below. And she said, yes, not just mysteries, but ghost stories, psychological thrillers, all of that are under the big umbrella. So well, I feel like I'm participating in the booktube stuff. <laughs> Next up, I want to tell you about a nonfiction in audio format that I heard about because I was on the audiophile website looking at the audiobooks that had been nominated for audiophile awards. And this one was there, The Last Slave Ship by Ben Raines. And the subject is what caught my interest. If you watch some of my previous videos, you know that I recently read The Door of No Return by Kwame Alexander. And before that, I read African Town by Charles Waters and Irene Latham. I will link the relevant videos below. And further back, a number of years ago, I read Barracoon by Nora Zeal Hurston. And I think there was also reference to this very same slave ship, the Clotilde, in 400 Souls, which is an anthology that was edited by Ibram Kendry and Keisha Blaine. Uh, the more that I read about what happened to this particular uh, group of 110 people who were stolen from what is now Benin and enslaved in the U.S. in Alabama for about five years until the end of the Civil War when they were freed and created their own town as they tried to save up enough money to get back to Africa and never were able to. Uh, the more interested I am in these individuals and their descendants. Now, The Door of No Return, it's actually set in the kingdom of Ashanti, which is now Ghana. It's around the same time period and I already knew that the Clotilde was called the last slave ship that we know of and that 
in about 1808 or somewhere around then, the importation of slaves was Ill became illegal in the U.S. But in Ben Rain's book, I learned that during an 18-month period in 1859 and 1860, there were about there were 85 ships modified for slaving in New York. So this was going on with the knowledge of uh, the authorities. Those ships probably deposited their cargo in Cuba and Brazil, but still, he says the historic record is rife with reports that slaves continued to pour in from Africa with some estimates suggesting that as many, there were as many as 10,000 a year. It's the, the legacy of these Clotilda survivors that really fascinates me. And how they overcame adversity and worked together to make this community and reconcile with their past and the people who wronged them. And Ben Rains, who's an environmental journalist, he actually found the ship. So all of that is in this book as well. The audiobook is read by Kevin R. Free. It's excellent. And next I'm going to tell you about another audiobook, Hijab Butch Blues by Lamia H. It's a memoir and before I forget, if you don't know, there is a new readathon happening in April. It's called People April, reading nonfiction about people. So here's a good pick for you if you're looking for suggestions. Uh, Lamia doesn't use her surname. She doesn't specify which country she was born in, only that it was a South Asian country and that her family moved when she was a child to a Middle Eastern Arabic speaking country. Doesn't specify. She's not out to her family. Reasons are explained. And she also has concerns for her own safety. She went to university in the U.S. and still lives in the U.S. I found this memoir reminded me a lot of Sabrina Imbler's How Far the Light Reaches. In Lamia's case, she is a devout Muslim, hence the hijab. Each chapter she uses as context a surah from the Quran. So different saints from the Quran. And I feel kind of foolish for not having realized this before, but the Old Testament of the Bible and the Quran have the same stories in them. So the names are slightly different, but it's easily, um, it's, it's easy to recognize Na and Noah and building the ark in the desert and Yunus and Jonas in the belly of the whale, Musa and Moses parting the Red Sea, Mariam and Mary being informed by an angel they are going to have a virgin birth, all of that. I'll read you a passage that I transcribed to give you an idea of her writing style. God is neither man nor woman, nor masculine nor feminine, nor not masculine nor not feminine. This God who teaches us that we can be both and neither and all and beyond and capable of multiplicities and expansiveness, non-binary, genderqueer, they. This God is the God, my God, my Allah, who created the world and created language and created the first person, Adam. This first person who was man and woman and neither and both and not a mistake, never a mistake. 
like me. At one point she uses the word situationships and I encountered this word for the first time just last week or two weeks ago in the book Sky Falling by Mia McKenzie and now here it is again. I feel like um, I get an education of all kinds when I read. Here Lamia talks about her family. To them, my hijab, my butch outfits of baggy jeans and flannel shirts read as modest. My short hair reads as convenience. And my rants about men pass as my angry feminism. When it comes to my family, my hijab is my beard. I love this memoir. The audiobook is read by Ashraf Shirazi and People April is coming up. Next is another nonfiction, Antigone Rising. The subtitle is The Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths. It's by Helen Morales, who is a British classicist. She now teaches in Santa Barbara. It's pretty much what it says on the title. She talks about how the Greek myths deal with difficult subjects like human weaknesses and um, abuses of power. Some of the cultural patterns that have become entrenched and that are reflected in myths are things that we need to change. The myth that men and boys cannot control themselves uh, from being distracted is an example of a myth that needs to change. She incorporates examples from her own life. She's a bisexual woman with a daughter who's 12 years old at the time of this uh, anecdote. When my daughter Athena was in middle school, the head of faculty, who was also the wife of the headmaster, told the girls that they could not have visible bra straps or exposed cleavage or wear short skirts because it was distracting to the male teachers. I'll just let that sink in. The wife of the headmaster told girls aged 12 that their bra straps cleavage and thighs must be covered lest they distract her husband and his male colleagues. When the girls pointed out that this was creepy and inappropriate, they were told that the teacher had misspoken, that what she had meant to say was that it would be distracting to the academic environment. We now know what this phrase means. So the way that she makes connections between myths and current issues like dress codes at school, I think is really well done. Uh, it's not a long book and I found it really engaging to read, gave me lots to think about. Um, here's an example. Ancient myth dramatizes sexual assault again and again. These myths have become a valued part of our culture. There are more paintings displayed in art museums in Europe and North America that feature a mythological rape scene than there are paintings displayed by female artists of color. She also mentions that the Louvre houses about 6,000 paintings, but only 21 women artists have works in the Louvre and none of them have been identified as women of color. So why do we read myths? Because there are myths that challenge the story, myths that reimagine, myths like some of the ones in Ovid's Metamorphosis that Ali Smith used when she wrote girl meets boy. That's the, the final chapter in here is trans mythology. She talks about how revenge fantasies that there are in some of these myths are not scripts to be followed, 
but what they are adrenaline shots for the hurt soul an essential part of the sexual assault survivors emergency kit I picked this up because Rebecca of Read Becca had listed it on her best nonfiction list of 2022. I'll link that down below. Thank you, Rebecca. I really enjoyed this. Next, I've got another nonfiction. This is a collection of essays. This strange visible air subtitled Essays on Aging and the Writing Life, and it is by Sharon Butala. I picked this up to have a Saskatchewan read in the Read Across Canada Challenge that Jolene is doing at Bookworm Adventure Girl. Links below. And I read one essay a day, and there are about 15 essays in here and I found the whole thing very enjoyable. Uh, Butala is in her 80s now and she's an elder. She has a lot of wisdom to share with uh, a real sense of humor. So concerns for uh, our world in general, for the aging population, feeling lonely, connecting with nature. Uh, if you like personal essays, I can recommend this to you. And this is the best book that I've read in the past week. A great big fat historical novel called The Lost Century. It is by Larissa Lai, who is a Chinese Canadian author. The century is a span of time, Hong Kong up until 1997. It opens when the British are about to do the handover back to China. And a young woman from Canada is there asking her great aunt about her life be just before and during the Second World War in Hong Kong. So mainly it's a story of two families in 1937 and 1941. We do go further back in time in this novel because one of the Chinese families came from Wang Nai Chung village and when the British came, this is what happened, a passage from the book. Wang Nai Chung was a wealthy village, country wealthy, I mean, not bank wealthy, stinking rich like the Taipans that grew out of the British Empire. But when the British came, the first thing they did was outlaw the growing of rice in the valley. The villagers went from being comfortable and content to poor and desperate, just like that. Aya, those demon bastards, I'm telling you. I love Violet's distinctive voice uh, throughout this novel. All the geopolitics under British colonialism and then uh, under Japanese imperialism during the Second World War. And it was a slow build, but wow. By the end, I stayed up two hours past my bedtime in order to finish this book. Just so good. If you've read Larissa Lai before, you might want to know that there's no speculative elements in this. It's straight up historical fiction, but it is Larissa Lai, so it is queer. Uh, yes, the, the great aunt Violet, who is telling the story is queer and uh, oh it's eye-opening there's some pretty gruesome parts during the war uh, but it's also extremely satisfying the complexities of 
the politics there are so fascinating. Here's a section where Violet is talking to Ophelia, her great niece. Don't you read your history books, Feely? Ah, I'm just going to skip a, skip ahead. You could be pro-democracy, but the possibility of being pro-democracy without being pro-British and therefore in favor of European colonialism was not yet available. You could be pan-Asian and anti-colonial, but then you'd find yourself supporting Japanese fascism. You could be a Chinese nationalist, but the Kuomintang leadership was notoriously corrupt and actively employed Nazi brown shirts to train its own blue shirts. You could be pro-communist, like Captain Lee and Quan Xu Wai, which in those days was probably the most noble option, but look at how many millions of people were murdered by the communists later in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. So complicated and so fascinating. I love this book, <laughs> it was just great. I forgot to say that when I purchased The Blue Road earlier this week from Glass Bookshop, they gave me this postcard of Larissa Lai instead of a bookmark. And this portrait was done by Lauren Crazybull, who is Blackfoot, Dene, and uh, she's based in Edmonton. So those are all the books I've got to tell you about. If you want to stick around, I will show you some of the processes that I used to dye a big piece of linen fabric that I am going to make into a pair of trousers. It was a thrifted linen tablecloth that I picked up at Value Village and I had to scour it and then treat it with a tannin bath and then uh, treat it with an alum mordant and then I dyed it with marigold petals and it got this gorgeous gold color but that was not the color I was aiming for. The final treatment was a dip into an iron bath which gave me this olive green color that I'm really happy with. So fingers crossed that I'm going to figure out how to make a pair of trousers that I like with this fabric. Stay tuned for more. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate hearing from you, so there's a place for comments down below. And let me know what you think of any of these books that I've talked about and what you're reading. I'm always interested in that. And I will see you again soon. Bye for now.